This is the Open University. Life in a Scotch Sitting Room, Volume 2, Episode 19. Hello, Strivers After Truth. Um, it's uh, a Monday afternoon. I usually record these things in the morning when my brain is uh, at its most fresh, but uh, perhaps it'll be uh, fresher to be unfresh. Ah, these tumbling paradoxes and contradictions, I can't seem to escape them. My theme today is uh, unintended consequences, or the intentional fallacy, or just the idea of planning your life, having a, a life goal, all these TED Talks and pep talks and uh, motivational books, self-help books and things that people buy in their millions, apparently. I should write a self-help book. That's an intention. That would change my life. Forget about changing your life. Maybe be a bit more Buddhist and um, actually decide to kick against the pricks who are telling you to, uh, to make a life plan, to use scheduling software to bring your, draw your life into order. Okay, let's start with literature, because I start personally with literature. Um, I'm a, a kind of uh, Inglit student. So, um, in Inglit, when we talk about the intentional fallacy, we're talking about... Um, hey, let's do something random. Um, I'm going to read the, the cup. Le temps qu'on le lait est entièrement mis dans le... The more I see that I didn't realize this was going to happen, but the more I turn the cup, the more it hurts because it's hot against my finger. So it becomes a an effort. Et mis entièrement dans le café et il boit. It's amazingly bad French, actually. It's a Chinese-made cup which I bought in a Japanese hundred yen store, and it says "Et um, il boit et le plus heureux." <laughs> Um, I think it means the time when you put the hot milk in the cup and, you, and then you drink it, that's the time when you're happiest, but <clears throat> completely grammatically wrong because it's saying um, the weather, um, le temps quand le f the weather when the milk is entirely put into the coffee and it drinks, the milk drinks, uh, uh, is the most happy. Um, the weather, yeah. So that's an unintended... Actually, a whole universe opens up with that grammatical error in which milk could be drinking something or milk could be happy. Uh, kind of much more wonderful to have the accidental universe opened up by the grammatical errors in that. People often say, why do Japanese companies use such bad English when they could employ me, English speaker, to correct them? But actually, I, I much prefer errors. I think errors are a great source of delight, humor, fascination. But I was telling you about the intentional fallacy. Another sip of my PG tips. <clears throat> um, the intentional fallacy in literature is when you give a shit about what the author intended to do in their poem or, you know, whether or not they actually explicitly unfolded what they intended to do. You're not supposed to take that too much into account. Um, the author is almost like a criminal giving witness in a trial to what they apparently were doing that night on the night of the crime. And... Um, it's all probably been fabricated post facto, post factum, post facto, um, and uh, we shouldn't really rely on it. And especially if we're critics of the school, which is called, um, well, I guess deconstruction or structuralism, or it's sort of any literary school since the uh, 1960s has essentially discounted. There's even been talk of the death of the author. You know, that it's the reader's response which matters, and that texts are intertextual, reaching out like octopi to other texts and making a kind of um, seamless um, polysemy, as Roland Barthes put it, um, with all other texts and, and, and that it's kind of a cultural babble, really, that, that doesn't matter. It's not affected that much by the particular node on the network who is the author. And of course, this is um, in the age of the internet, we embrace this even more fully. I mean, my babble in this video is just part of a, a whole sequence of vlogging babble and television babble that you could do now go off to other places on YouTube to watch. Um, you could say that I'm deliberately um, connecting myself to the Open University programs of the 70s, which I'm pastiching, <coughs> but also to all the other vloggers of today who I'm watching, kind of 
I'm trying to find one who's as good as me or as, as intelligent as me, but it's it's very difficult. I, I mean, there are there are obviously very smart vloggers who manage to attract millions of views, but they don't seem to be they don't seem to be scratching the same itches that I'm scratching. I don't know. I'm, I, but anyway, this is probably why I get so few views. But anyway, the intentional fallacy is basically putting too much weight on what an author says they were trying to achieve. So, um, I mean, I, I, I personally find author statements wonderful. I've recently been finding out about a poet, Marianne Moore, a modernist American poet uh, who I knew nothing about. I, I had vaguely heard one of her lines, which is probably her most famous line, which is about, um, is it in a poem called Poetry, which begins, I too hated uh, poetry, uh, but then says, but actually there's a kind of sincerity that comes through in a poem uh, and, and there's a kind of uh, magic in, in there if you actually stick with it. And there are um, real toads in imaginary gardens. That's her most famous line, I guess, uh, Marianne Moore. I want to investigate further. I mean, I, uh, there's a fantastic poem um, called The Octopus in which she describes a, a, uh, an iceberg as an octopus, kind of shaped like an octopus. But she said, for instance, about her poetry that she, she was a bad reader of her own poems, unlike Ezra Pound, who, was, who manages to elevate everything he writes with this fantastic high-flown poetic voice, or Yeats, who who's was a very dramatic theatrical reader of his own work. Marion Moore couldn't do that. She said she made, she typed her poems, first of all. Technology, very important. That was the technology of her period, the typewriter. She liked how it sounded, how, how she could edit with a typewriter on, on an A4 sheet, and how a poem would look when it was laid out. And she, she was essentially an editor. She was also a, a typist. I mean, that's what she did for a living at some points in her life. She also edited and stuff. So she loved making poetry for the eye. It's not quite concrete poetry, but it's like E.E. E. Cummings in the sense that it's laid out very carefully with some very, you could say, even heavy-handed editing, very formalistic, uh, aesthetic uh, editing. So it's as much about the how as the what she's saying. Um, but as a good student of literature, we should discount her saying even that, even the biographical information we have um, about her using typewriters and having being an editor and all the rest of it. We should sort of bracket that and say, well, actually, what does it mean to us and what has it meant in culture? And lots of other things you can connect it to in a parallel way. Um, that's just the literary side, the intentional fallacy. Uh, it's, it's just spelled out as a more negative thing to do in literature, literary studies. Um, we don't really hear about the intentional fallacy so much in politics except I guess it's called lies in that context because people have manifestos, parties and, and politicians have manifestos in which they say what their intentions are and then we're supposed to vote according to their intentions but they know and we know that they're going to break every single promise, they're not going to do the things they say in the manifesto. That in itself is also um, showing the fallacy of intention. Um, it's, you know, Okay, he's, he says he's going to do X, but he's actually going to do Y, partly because you have to make dirty compromises in politics, that's what politics is about, but also because um, uh, things change and uh, situations are, you know, and also politicians now in the, in the neoliberal era or the post-neoliberal era are talking themselves out of a job. I mean, they all have to come along saying we hate big government, you know, we hate politicians. Oh, we are politicians, but we hate politicians. Let's minimize the role of politicians. We hate red tape, blah, blah, blah. I hate red tape. You hate red tape. We all hate, you know, administration planning, partly because we realize it's futility. We realize that, um, you know, what do governments do once they get power? They issue these uh, bits of legislation which are meant to change life and to some extent do, but are often botched and compromised and there are all sorts of, um, you know, there's uh, lobbying, there's money and there's all sorts of, you know, there's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip in politics. And um, actually, this is a hopeful uh, message that comes out of intention, uh, the intentional fallacy, is that we don't actually know what's going to result. Maybe Trump, it looked like a 
disaster when Trump was elected to me. But, you know, maybe if he creates a trade war, you know, there's no way that a politician could have announced the intention to run down and degrade the United States, which I personally would think would be quite a good thing because the United States doesn't deserve its current prominence. It is over, man. You know, India and China are the rising powers. We know that. But um, if a European politician stood up and said, let's uh, do down America, it's the time for America just to go. I mean, some German politicians are now raising their voices a little bit about, um, you know, America is no longer a trusted out. We can't really trust America to be on our side anymore because, first of all, we have different philosophies. But secondly, they're so damned unpredictable right now. You know, they're protectionist one minute and interventionist the next. And it uh, depends whether Bolton is still there. Is he still there in charge of defense? Yeah, I think he is. But, um, you know, he issues a statement which Trump then contradicts, you know, and Trump's Twitter feed is saying something different from what the White House official spokesman is saying, blah, blah, blah. So it's chaos, but it's actually, that's, that's really good. I like the fact that they don't seem to know what the hell they're doing and, and that they're making idiots of themselves. And Trump is now saying, today's news is, or Trump says, I, I probably have the power to pardon myself, you know, but I'm not going to do it. A, we don't believe for a minute that he's not going to pardon himself if he possibly can. This is in the context of, I guess, the Russian, the Mueller inquiry. Um, and B, you know, he's probably just raising this, you know, with a negative spin at the moment and in order later to remind us, oh, actually, I do have the power to pardon myself. I've just looked up, I've looked up the rules or my lawyers have looked up the rules, whatever. I do have that power and I'm going to do it, actually. I've changed my mind. I'm going to pardon myself. Whatever. You know, just whatever. The law of unintended consequences is one of the great things about life, that we are, we think we're rational. And this is why we have to talk about Horkheimer and Adorno and the uh, dialectic, uh, dialectic of enlightenment. Enlightenment seemed to be a move away from enchantment towards a rational world where everything is planned and controlled. And when you're flying in a plane, of course, you want that to be true. I personally watch a lot of these documentaries which talk about why planes crash. And there's always another lurking piece of metal fatigue or a little washer that's missing or whatever that, that will cause the plane crash that will kill you. And of course, the documentaries always say, well, this will never happen again. Of course, that won't happen again because you did this investigation. You found out what had gone wrong, but something else quite similar or a chain of events. They always start off with... A fatal accident is a chain of events. It's an unforeseen and unfortunate combination of circumstances which, you know, nobody... OK, you mustn't make fuel, AAA kerosene, too hot, but you also mustn't make it too cold. It can get iced. And even the de-icing techniques, you know, can be inadequate. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it's all fascinating. A bit scary if you fly regularly as well. But, um, yeah, I think it's personally very hopeful that uh, we don't know how things are going to turn out. Our lives don't really, can't really have a plan. This is something David Bowie used to say a lot. Um, he doesn't think, in, he didn't think very far ahead, you know. Uh, he, he really just lived each day as it came. This was a partly his Buddhist training, I think, but also his, um, um, his realism, his reality. Um, finally, um, unintended... Um, means to me uh, what I've described in an essay I wrote a long time ago, but it keeps coming back to me as the, the arrow and the frame. Uh, intentions and opinions are an arrow that's within a frame, and it doesn't actually matter where the arrow is pointing, where, which way the wind blows that weather vane. What matters is the way something is framed and the way, uh, the, the, way the cards fall, the randomness of, of, of the context as well as the intentionality of the context. So it matters much more. You know, it doesn't... Don't give me your identity politics and your opinions about things, your witch hunts based on judging other people, all that stuff which has been so tedious uh, in recent history, especially on the internet, where opinions suddenly seem to be tremendously important. Um, don't give me that because um, what matters in terms of Google AdSense, for instance, is simply that you're talking about a subject and therefore we can it's relevant to you in some way and we can advertise stuff around it to you. Um, it doesn't actually matter that your opinion is for it or against it or your opinion is shifting or, you know, if you're talking about right-wing memes, you're spreading right-wing memes. Um, so a little example of this, somebody French was uh, uh, emailing me the other day and she said that uh, in France they say that... Uh, 
men age like um, wine and women age like milk. And she said, I hate this saying. Um, and I said, well, actually, I've never heard that saying before. You're, t you're the first person who's ever mentioned this to me. Perhaps it's well known in France, but uh, I said, it doesn't really matter whether you agree with it or not. You've, you've simply spread it. So in terms of the, the meme, the virus of that idea that men and women age differently and men age much better than women and it's, you know, you hate that if you're a woman, uh, you like it if you're a man. I slightly like that idea, obviously, because I'm a man, but um, um, I can see why it's a hateful idea as well. Um, it's because it's politically kind of incorrect that it's not egalitarian. Um, nevertheless, all that idea wants in order to thrive is, f is for her to have mentioned it to me. And now it's in my brain. And now, oh my God, I've just spread it through YouTube to all of my 32 subscribers. No, I think I have more than 32 subscribers. But, you know, whatever. This, will, this video, I'm going to predict it's going to get mm, 777 views exactly. Oh, better than 666. Um, and uh, I just spread that idea that terrible toxic idea to all of you. So it doesn't matter what my intention was. I, d I didn't intend, to, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean to be, you know, honest gov. Um, but I did it, you know, and um, that is the fact. Uh, it's not, not my intention. It kind of was my intention because I wanted to talk about intention today. Anyway, yeah, I've talked about intention. That's today's um, thing. God, I have a different energy in the afternoon, don't I? Perhaps, perhaps it's actually been quite good to break my habits. It's actually quite interesting, the relationship habits to intentions. Um, I think people who sell products to us, the really great thing to do if you're selling stuff to people is to get inside their habit routines. Like I, I release these videos maybe once a week on average and um, it's kind of important to have a schedule where people kind of, after a week or so, they start thinking, I wonder if that mama's guy has done another video. Those of you who give it down, you know, um, to get inside people's habit routines. Oh yeah, I can watch this when I get home from work, or whatever, he's just uploaded something. So um, it's, uh, that's really the secret of human life is, it's all about habits really. And some habits might be based on rationality, but most of them are not. They're, they're mostly just self-replicating, like memes are, like viruses are. Their one raison d'etre is simply to perpetuate themselves. And it doesn't matter what you, whether a habit is a good one or a bad one. All that matters is that the habit gets to reproduce itself. And if it involves buying something, I have this habit just now of buying an a, um, iced latte from 7-Eleven here in Japan because it's only 180 for quite a decent tasting iced latte, which you kind of make yourself at their machine in a little ice cup, which you can then take to a nice location and drink for half the price of a cafe bought ice latte. Uh, that's become my habit and that's um, whether good or bad, maybe I'm putting artis artisanal um, cafes out of business doing that. Um, I'm helping a big chain, 7-Eleven, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, uh, that's kind of irrelevant to me. Uh, what's relevant is simply that it's a habit that I've picked up. Anyway, yeah, I'm going to um, say goodbye in a habitual way. But think about intentions and think about their relation to other things, to politics, to habit, to literature. I think it's jolly interesting. The Open University.